Welcome to a special On Location bookmark. We're here in Chicago with the Catholic Marketing Network, and we're joined by author Matthew Bunsen, who stopped by to, to see us. Good to see you again, Matthew. Great to be with you again. And we're going to talk to you specifically about St. Kateri, Lily of the Mohawks, and a little bit about the Encyclopedia of Saints as well. Sure. One of the things I noted with this, uh, you know, we got to talk way back when at the very beginning of Bookmark. We did. And then uh, recently we got to talk again, and now the third time. So it's great. It's great to see you again. I'm it's happy been a while. to come on any time. That's great. That's great. And we are, doing, as we noted in our last episode, uh, you and I are significantly older than the first time we talked. That's so, right, exactly. Yeah. And we could show pictures Hopefully of that wiser. if we really uh, looking to yeah. give each other a hard time. Yes. And you were also uh, working with Jerry Usher, right? I was, yeah, uh, for Vocation Boom Television. Right, this show that we're doing as well. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about both of these is that there's two names on this. There are. Matthew and Margaret Bunsen. Now, a lot of people might when they see that think, well, is that your sister or your wife? But right. it wasn't, right? In Who is fact, it? it is my late mother, uh, okay. who was uh, an author, painter, uh, illustrator for uh, New York publishing companies. Oh, really? Uh, for okay. quite a few years. These books, uh, the Kateri book, the Encyclopedia of Saints, uh, the one that we talked about in our, one of our last episodes, right, Encyclopedia right. of American Catholic History. Well, we did at Franciscan University? Uh, I think so. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. Those were very special books for me because those are the last projects I was able to work with mm -hmm. her on and she passed away in May of 2012. Right, right. And so it was a, a privilege to work with her all those mm. years. Uh, and, we and we got you, along really well. And how so. did you work together? How, how did, did you, uh, were you living in the same location? Were you doing stuff via internet or email? How did yeah, it work? Yeah, well, it was, uh, it's, a, it's a long story, but uh, she and I were primary caregivers mm -hmm. uh, to my late dad and then okay. to my, my late brother. And they both had Huntington's disease. Oh, okay. So uh, God provided very nicely, first for me to be a full-time writer right. uh, for 25 years now, and then for us all to live together to right. take care of each other. Right. And so it was, it, it, it was a beautiful experience to be a caregiver like that, but it, it also then created the atmosphere to do some of these remarkable projects, to have a genuine privilege to work on some right. of these And books. how many books have you put together together? Uh, let's see, I think there were about eight or nine mm -hmm. that we worked on together. And how many by yourself? Uh, last count, about 50. About 50 by yourself, yeah. okay. Yeah. And that's why this book is dedicated to the memory of Margaret R. Bunsen, yes. right? Yes, yeah. She was uh, 83 when she passed and worked literally to the day that she finally passed. Right. Now this work, this. Um, it's out now, but the reason your mother was involved in it was because it originally came out, what, in 2001 or something? Yeah, like? uh, it was uh, quite a few years back, and of course Kateri at that point was still blessed. Blessed, right. And to mark the occasion of her canonization, okay. uh, our Sunday visitor asked if we could do an updated one. Okay. Uh, and in a way, it, it was perfect because the book came out right at the start of the canonization period, so in, in October of 2012. Mm -hmm. But there was so much new material that we could put in uh, especially the, the, the influence of John Paul II, the discussions of the amazing miracle that led to So there's a lot new in this book. There's an immense amount of material that's new. Now, right in the beginning, you have a quote from her. I am no longer my own. I have given myself entirely to Jesus Christ. Yeah. One of the things I found in reading through this book is the idea of how, of how much we know about her Right. And I guess the source material that, that's available from, I guess, the Jesuits who, who knew her. Exactly. Right? You would think at first blush that we would know very little about her right, because right. here was someone who lived in the wilderness of New York and then up in, near Montreal. Uh, she was among the Native American peoples who, let's just say that record keeping sometimes is not what it should be. And yet, uh, we have the writings of the Jesuits who knew her, uh, Father Jacques de Lamberville, uh, Father Cholinac, Father Chiquetier. Their writings, though, weren't simply observational. They, they weren't simply making an account of what the mission life was like in this young woman who came to them so briefly and then died. Right, they saw something in her. They did. Right. Uh, Jacques de Lamberville saw something in her from the day he met her mm -hmm. uh, in a cabin in a little village uh, where he eventually baptized her. They were writing what became a testimony to her holiness. Mm. And when you read their accounts right. of her, what, what is especially striking is, uh, there's a technical term that we use uh, for the, the canonization of saints, and that's a positio. Mm -hmm. It's a defense, it's a document, a position paper, right. trying to discuss and to prove somebody's heroic virtue mm -hmm. that this person was a saint. That's exactly what the Jesuits were writing about her five years after Without her realizing death. that's what they were doing? I have the, the impression. Or do you think they were thinking of I, that? I think they were, mm -hmm. uh, because her fame had already spread across. Yeah, well, she, when she died, they just said the saint, the saint is, is dead. The saint is dead, yeah. right? Yeah. So these, these Jesuit priests recognized in her the heroic virtue. They recognized the, the spiritual legacy that she left behind. They saw in her a saint, and they wanted everyone else, not just in, in 
French Canada to know this, mm -hmm. but all the way to the royal court in France. And in fact, their books, their memoirs, their accounts of her were read across all of France. So she became somebody, uh, to use another technical phrase, the fama sanctitatis, the fame of sanctity, spread very rapidly. How was something that, like that received at that, that, that day and age? How would it have been seen in Europe, the idea that a Native American could be a saint? I mean, obviously right. she needs to be baptized. You know, certainly the idea was these people need to be saved. Yeah. Well, uh, but the fact that she could be a saint. You hit on something that's really important too when we read the accounts of the Jesuits. In a way, it, it enhances her significance to them. Context is everything, especially in historical writings. Right. And many times they, they write somewhat disparagingly of the especially of the, of the Native Americans. Right, right. They viewed them as... They used non-PC terms exactly, and things like that. Exactly, things that right. today would be patently offensive. Right. Which is why so many times in looking back in history, we say, oh, look how terrible they were, without right. understanding the nature of what was going on at the time. Right. And how people talked and thought about them. Sure. Right. And, and Rightfully to, or wrongfully. But. We have to take it into account when we're reading these things. But what, what comes out of that is their awe mm -hmm. at her spirituality her love of the sacraments, her commitment to Jesus Christ, her desire to be an authentic Catholic. And they were deeply impressed by all of the things that would have impressed them about anyone, anyone in Europe would, who had right. accomplished the same spiritual heights. Well, one of the things that struck me too is there's this beautiful little picture on the front of Kateri. Yeah. And you know, somebody might think, oh, they think of some old movie with some very cute little right. you know, uh, Indian girl with yep. the pigtails looking. But here's, here's a girl who basically had suffered smallpox yes. and was marked by that. And yes. so was clearly not necessarily somebody you would look at and just uh, immediately think, oh, wow, how beautiful, how she's right. filled with the Lord. So yeah. they saw past that to her soul in a lot of ways. They did, and, and I think that the black robes were especially uh, gifted at that. Uh, someone like Jacques de Lamberville, I mean, when we think of the black robes, we think of these beautifully trained, superbly educated Jesuits holding doctorates in philosophy, theology, and canon law, setting out into the wilderness to, to bring Christ there. So they arrived with immense spiritual depth and, and the ability to read hearts. I think that's one of the real gifts of the black robes. And I, I, when Jacques de Lamberville first encountered her, he saw that immediately in her. But I think they also understood that suffering in her background had left its mark, but right. it also helped to shape her and to make her even more receptive to, to grace and to the sacraments and to the, to the life of faith. Okay, great. <clears throat> one of the things that struck me right in the beginning of the forward, and I guess this was Monsignor Paul A. Lenz, it looks like it was kind of written maybe with the original edition in mind, because he talks about the beatification. But I found this interesting, he talks about, one of the first questions I was asked uh, when he was on Vatican Radio was, did Kateri Tikowitha really live? Yep. Or has she just been a name to, to please the Indians? And I was thinking, kind of like we, what we heard for a while there about Juan Diego, where there was, well, is he really a personage or is he some embodiment of you know, uh, several people, or was he just made up by the Spaniards to, to say, hey, see, you can be like him, let's all convert. Sure, an instrument simply of, of evangelization right. that they created. A, a marketing tool, <laughs> if you want yes. to say, right? Right, with very good branding. Right, right. That's the value, especially in this edition, of being able to incorporate so much of the writings of the Jesuits who knew her. We have the writings of uh, saying Lamberville, of Cholinac, of Chiquetier. These were the, the men who, baptized her, who formed her, who heard her confessions, who gave her the, the Eucharist. Uh, all of the things that you would expect from anyone who had this encounter with a saint and was left moved. And, right. and in a way, their lives were changed. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to document for future generations that this woman did actually live. Uh, and to serve as a role model, interestingly enough, not just for the Native Americans, and which she certainly is, but for all Catholics. I mean, her life just before her death would be exemplary for any Catholic under any circumstances anywhere in the world, proving the universality of holiness and the universality of the faith. Right, because also if you read her storyline, obviously she didn't live very long, yeah. but uh, her, her mother was a Christian, right? Yes, she was. And that's where she got her faith from but she kind of grew up. Why don't you talk a little bit about how she grew up in an environment that obviously wasn't very open to, right. to her Catholicism. Right. Well, we were talking just a minute ago about tragedy shaping her. Uh, she was born to an Algonquin woman who was a captive uh, among the Mohawks. 
she, her mother was a Christian. Mm -hmm. But her entire family was wiped out when she was merely four years old from smallpox. Right. She herself was left scarred for life by it. Not only with the, the, the facial scarring, but she could not walk out into the sun. Right, that's uh, right. Bright right. sun because right. of her poor vision. So these things, uh, as I said, left their mark on her, but she was then handed over to relatives who were not Christian and who did two things. One, they were, as was the, the custom of the times, adamantly opposed to any dealings with the French, which meant they were very hostile to the Catholic faith because of their alliance with the English. Right. Uh, but the other and was... They, and many times they aligned with the English because the English were less invasive, at least initially. Right. Right. They weren't really interested in converting them into anything. They just wanted to trade with them. And the English were better at making promises than the French were. Right. right. Uh, and, and here we have that, that wider context of Kateri living in an era of the building of empires from Europe into the New World. Uh, and all of this helped shape her life. But the other thing that her family did was to pressure her constantly because of her position in, in what's called the turtle clan. And to get married. To get married. Right. Which she began refusing to do at a very early age. Right. In the age of 13, it was unheard right. of that she was not married. And yet she remained firm in the face of persecution long before she became a Christian. So there was something in her that was calling her to something deeper. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, just before she died in 1679, she made that vow. She took a vow, right. A vow yeah. that Christ alone would be for her. Right. So it was, a, it was a culmination of a whole life of suffering, but a whole life of conforming herself uh, to the cross. Right, not only she, she would tell the women who were involved, I'm not doing it. There was a time, you, I guess you talk about with a young man is even yes. there. She just kind of says, get lost, <laughs> right. and, and walks he was, out. He right. was mortified, and, yeah. and her family even more so, because this is a blow to their prestige, but also sort of building alliances. Yeah, and, because that's how one would structure oneself inside right. the tribe. So she was an outlier from the beginning. Right, right. You say, our knowledge of St. Kateri would be all but non-existent had it not been for the letters and biographies penned by the Black Robes, as the Jesuits were called, who served with such fidelity at the, how do you pronounce it, the mission is... The salt mission? Yes. The salt, salt mission. mission. And that's ultimately where she ended up. Yes, right? in Montreal. Because of the persecution that she faced as a Christian, and this was an experience uh, encountered by so many of the different Native American converts, especially among the Mohawk and the Iroquois tribes, they would be forced to leave their communities. Mm -hmm. And so the Jesuits very wisely put together a Christian community right. up near Montreal. And so <laughs> kind they, of a refuge where they could live out their faith. Exactly. Right. Where they could be safe, uh, but also because this was such a new faith to so many of the Native Americans, they needed that supportive environment uh, where they had the sacraments, where they could con continue to deepen in the faith with each other. Right. And of course, that was uh, what made Kateri's arrival near Montreal so extraordinary, mm -hmm. because here was somebody who was already perfecting the virtues, who took to the Christian faith so naturally, so readily, that she became a kind of star mm -hmm. within the community, but also faced some jealousies, mm -hmm. as, as saints often do. Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah. Nothing like a little original sin, <laughs> pride, and jealousy to mix yeah. into the, the cauldron of faith. And, and her own development, uh, progressing as it was so rapidly, uh, quickly gained the attention of the Jesuits who were up there. And, and so they marked her as well. And you, you talk about the question could be asked about Kateri's relevance for the modern world and for today's Catholics. You say Kateri is also a beautiful example of an important truth that Pope, blessed uh, Pope John, St. John Paul now stressed throughout his pontificate. And I guess you kind of say St. Kateri demonstrates that it's possible to be a faithful, holy Catholic while still embodying the very best of her culture. Yes. And that's the thing, that proper balance, right, of enculturation. Because right. sometimes these days, enculturation, which was a very popular term years ago, as sometimes when people hear that now, they think, oh, that just means you figured out ways to kind of loosen up the faith. Right, watering down the right, faith. Right, exactly. Yeah, the, the Jesuits were exceptionally good at learning the languages of the people that they were evangelizing. So her mother, for example, learned much of the gospel in, in Mohawk. The, the Jacques de Lamberville was, was excellent in, in Mohawk, as all the black robes were. Actually being able to present aspects of the faith in someone's original language, right. uh, explaining it in terms culturally that they can understand. They could understand what right. they do, right. This is exactly what the Second Vatican Council called us to do today. Mm -hmm. This is what we're talking about with so many aspects of the new evangelization, that we have to be able to speak the language of the world, uh, not to water down the faith, but to make the, the truths of the faith accessible to the heart and to the mind.
of, of people, and, and that's exactly what happened with the, the, the Mohawks uh, that converted, and, and Kateri, I think, is a prime example of that. It's interesting, too, because you note that, and this was based on a 2003 report, yeah. that Native Americans, that's 580,000 or 20% of the total population, uh, belonging to more than 300 tribes and nations, Native Americans, 340 parishes. Wow, right. I would never realize that uh, that serve predominantly Native American congregations. Yeah. You don't really think of it that way anymore. You no, don't really you don't. hear about. I mean, you might hear about the Indian missions, but it's not clear whether those people are Catholic or just poor Indians who you're trying to help out. Right. Know? Well, the the story of Kateri in a way is is a beautiful door to appreciating the work of the church among mm -hmm. Native Americans throughout the whole of the history of North America, not just the United States. Right, okay. We can see with the community up in Montreal that they were deeply concerned about the spiritual welfare, not just of the converts, but of all Native Americans. In the church from the earliest times, we, we can see this in the Southwest with that great wave of uh, the Spanish, the, the arrival of the, the Franciscan friars and the mm -hmm. Augustinians. They were genuinely concerned about the, the souls of the Native Americans. Right. So there's this, this a, a golden thread, it's a, a great line that runs through American Catholic history in the United States mm -hmm. of the church actually being much more concerned about the, the welfare of the Native Americans right. than certainly the English were. But well, unfortunately, the English wrote the history books. And they so do. Uh, yeah. they, the French and the Spanish turned out right. to be not such good good guys in, in those. And I always right. talk about the Errol Flynn movies where you know <laughs> the Spanish were always the bad guys, you know. But you talk about, the way you break the book, you've got the worlds of St. Kateri. Yes. You talk, kind of give people a lay of the land, what it was like at the time, uh, her life and her legacy. And it's interesting uh, because, you know, it is confusing and it's very helpful to kind of understand the relationships between the Indians because you get some idea that some Indians were friendly to the Americans, so to speak, and some were on the British side and some were on the French side and, right. and how that broke up and the Eurons versus the Iroquois. So it gives you kind of a under, better understanding and you talk about the, the five nations, et cetera. Yeah, well, that's, I, we thought it was very important to include the worlds as we call them. Uh, that the natural world, because Kateri loved uh, the wilderness, she would pray in the wilderness, always coming back though to the, the central place of the Eucharist in her life but treasuring the native world. Mm -hmm. And then there was that world of the, of the Native Americans. As, as we were talking just a few minutes ago, this right. is an era of empire building. Right. Uh, the Dutch, who were then superseded by the English, you had the French, you had the Spanish to the south. The new world was being carved up and the, the Native Americans were seen as little more than pawns uh, in this massive chessboard that extended from Europe across the Atlantic and then right. into the new world. And it is one of the tragedies of history, of course, that the, the Native Americans were seen as mere instruments to statecraft. Right, right. Uh, and, and that's where I think the, the legacy of the black robes is so important to cherish because they, they saw beyond that. So as the Jesuit missions nevertheless continued among the Iroquois and finally even the Mohawk, progress was made between 1668 and 86 among the Mohawk converts was Kateri Tekawitha. To the south, meanwhile, this was, the Abenaki Indians in modern New England made the decision to ask the missionaries to be sent to them, marking one of the great stories of Indian Catholicism. Yes, and, and they paid a terrible price for it. Mm -hmm. Because as the English gained the upper hand right. in North America, uh, not only were the Native Americans being pushed ever westward, right. but those that were converted uh, were persecuted, right. uh, which is one of the reasons why it took so long. This question is often right. asked, why did it take, if she had this reputation, until 1943 for her to right. be venerable, 1980 to be beatified, and then 2012 right. to be canonized. It's exactly that drama of empires and wars right. and English supremacy and in, the, in, in right. North America. Yeah, well, I always quote because the Abenaki Indians are the Indians who in the Northwest Passage are the bad guys who have to be attacked and wiped out. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Once who, again, the English Who knew they were Catholic the at yes. the time watching there? Kill those Abenakis there. And, and it's also because the smallpox and things was basically diseases brought by the Europeans. Yes. Which is one of the reasons why the Iroquois uh, didn't really like the black robes because they saw those as heralds of the threat taking people away from the five nations from their traditions and their lives. Right. Yeah, it, it, the Iroquois were understandably very xenophobic. Uh, they were very enclosed. They were very defensive of their culture and traditions mm -hmm. because they saw the encroachment of the white man uh, pressing ever forward. And because of their alliance with the English, they were worried about losing that if uh, the too many became Catholic because mm -hmm. of that, that tie again with the French. 
Uh, they were concerned about trade, they were concerned about fur. And then, of course, you had the French uh, who were occupying so much of Canada to the mm -hmm. north that was considered very important land uh, to, the, to the Iroquois. So there were a lot of different right. political, right. social, religious things at play, uh, and all of them had this impact on Kateri's own life and how one, one life of a saint can be shaped in this environment and still find faith to such a profound degree, I think is, is a, it's a testament to the power of sanctity. And uh, Kateri's name, what is it? One who puts things in order, yes. kind of is what it is? Yes, the Tekakwitha. Yeah, and who's Hot Cinders? Uh, Hot Cinders was an uncle uh, oh. who was instrumental in helping her to escape her terrible environment and to uh, get to Montreal. Get to the ocean, right. Yeah. Now, her last known words were, Jesus, I love you. Yes. And, is, and that's based on what a contemporary... Eyewitness testimony. Of, of yeah. what exactly got said. Yeah, and, and her entire passing was a, a testament to mm -hmm. how she had lived. I mean, she was a Christian for only four years. Right. Uh, but as I was saying, that the, the Jesuits write about the perfection of the virtues to a heroic right. degree. And then there's the story, the account that everyone mentions, that soon after her death, the scars on her face uh, went away and there was almost a light in her. Right. And it was almost immediately after her death that miracles began happening. And in those Jesuit accounts, they go to great lengths to have actual depositions from mm -hmm. people testifying to the miracles. miracles so the time. Jesuits were concerned uh, that people would dismiss this out of hand. Right. So they had, oh, they're just making it up. Right. right. Exactly. Again, to market the faith. Right. The list is, is almost endless of people right. who had miracles of healing, but also miracles of transformation of people coming to the faith of disasters being averted all through Kateri's intercession. So we've got St. Kateri, Lily of the Mohawks. You've also got uh, our Sunday Visitors Encyclopedia of Saints. Now this is the second edition with a forward by uh, Timothy Cardinal Dolan of New York. Now yes. these books are terrific, but in the age of the internet, you know <laughs> yes. what I mean? Uh, right. You know, when I can get my iPhone and kind of look stuff up. Right. What, well, What's the use of things like these in your mind? Well, we should say the old school is still good. Okay. Uh, okay. Anyone who deals now in, in Catholic publishing knows you have to have, it's an and-and proposition. Okay. You still need to have these reference books, which mm -hmm. is even a more basic thing. When you go on the internet, you're never quite sure what you're getting. That's true. A lot mm -hmm. of sites, even earnest ones, uh, can be hopelessly unreliable. Uh, there's the obvious big name that everyone thinks of, you know, Wikipedia. Right, sure. Uh, that is useful if you're just trying to find something quickly. Right, but you got to remember, this is basically individuals putting in their own belief of what something's true or not true. Right. Right. And a compendium like this is really useful to have because it's at your fingertips. Uh, you can keep it in libraries for schools and elsewhere. Books have continued to play and will continue to play a, a vital role, I think, in, in the life of the culture. Right. Uh, it, witness the number of books that right. we're finding here at, at the, the... Right, Catholic, exactly, right. At the CMN. They said publishing was dead, right? Right. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> they should come here and look at the book show. Uh, it's interesting, too, because uh, as just looking in here quickly, I mean, you also get an opportunity to realize there are, there are so many people and saints over the years you've never heard in your mind. In fact, I love this one because it's a Welsh saint honored in Wales, little known, known for certain about his life or his ministry. Because I love the Welsh because they have names with no vowels in them. Yes. Uh, G-R-W-S-T. Uh, right. Grutzt or whatever, however it's pronounced. Well, I joke that a book yeah. like this is often very popular for kids looking up confirmation names just to irritate their, their parents. Their parents? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, this is another one, the, the famous Gudelia. A Persian martyr. She suffered in the persecution of King Shapur II. Right. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, whoever a, a two thousand year realized, legacy of yeah. faith in these books, and and it, it's fun to chart how the saints have changed in a way uh, over the centuries, over these. The what do you mean? Millennium. How have they changed? Well, included in this edition is every saint and blessed mm -hmm. of John Paul II. Right. John right. Paul II's in here. Uh, no. John okay. so is This in is here. very up to date. Right. What we're seeing is the, the, the growth of the church globally. So included is Josephine Baquita, Kateri. Right. Okay. I saw the Vietnamese martyrs. The Vietnamese and, martyrs. Right. So we're, you can chart the mm -hmm. expansion of the church uh, to becoming a global right. faith with a book like this. And as it ripples out. Right, sense, and, and right. we were just talking about Kateri, right. the, the universality of faith. And, and John Paul II always stressed that the, the, the faith 
holiness is for everyone. Right. But it's also very contemporary. It's very right. timely. Mm -hmm. A book like this is a testament that we have saints today. Mm -hmm. uh, Gianna Beretta Mola, mm -hmm. yeah, Padre right. Pio, John Paul II, even John the Twenty Third. Right. These are all contemporaries of ours. Right. Uh, so the idea that, that sanctity is something medieval, right. something of the past, isn't true. Well, we've had the pleasure at EW10 of, of working with several people who I won't name right now, but right. people would think about who I think someday might be named a saint. Precisely, and yeah. So. Uh, and, and that's the other thing about a book like this, right. that we're going to need another edition in right. 10 years right. because there are new saints, more saints. Right. More popes are likely to be beatified or canonized. Paul VI, So example. they keep you in business? Yes. Yeah, so okay, that's great. That's well, good. Do you have another book in the works? Uh, a couple. Uh, a couple we're, we're finishing the uh, 2015 edition of the Catholic Almanac that'll be okay. out. Uh, and then uh, I'll keep you posted. Okay, good. Some other good things to see you again. Up. Always a pleasure. It's, Thank it's you, a Matthew. privilege and a pleasure. Oh, great. Matthew Bunsen here talking to him about uh, the new edition of the Encyclopedia of Saints, but more specifically, St. Kateri, Lily of the Mohawks. Quite interesting. He wrote it with his beloved mom, and you can check it out on EW10's Religious Catalog. Thank you for joining us on location at the Catholic Marketing Network in Chicago. Thanks. Thank you.